Hello, my YouTube friends, and welcome back to another Generation Behind Hi-Fi video. I kind of feel like I should be wearing a ski mask right now because I just bought these JBL Studio 630 bookshelf speakers for 50% off their original MSRP. And at that price, they offer tremendous value for money. So I know a lot of people are probably curious about the cabinet construction, the TS parameters of the drivers, and the crossover. So we're gonna tear this speaker down and I'm gonna show you all that stuff. So let's get started. The first thing I'm gonna do is remove the mid-range driver and it's not coming out without a fight. JBL has installed this beauty ring around the woofer to hide the mounting bolts. The problem is the beauty ring is glued in several places and can be difficult to remove. You definitely want to take your time when removing this ring or you could risk damaging the woofer. Here I'm using an old credit card and butter knife to remove this beauty ring. After the beauty ring has been removed, I then use a 3mm allen tool to remove the four bolts that fasten the woofer to the front baffle. Uh-oh, do you see the loose screw attached to the woofer's magnet assembly? Looks like one of the workers forgot to tighten a screw inside the cabinet or dropped one while they were assembling my speakers. Oops. Hopefully it will be obvious where this screw belongs as I remove more parts. The mid-range driver out of the Studio 630 is pretty decent for this speaker's $700 price point. JBL is using a die-cast aluminum basket which offers several performance benefits over the typical stamped steel baskets that I normally see in this price range. Die-cast aluminum is more rigid and will offer less ringing over a stamped steel basket. Die-cast baskets also have cooling benefits over their stamped steel competitors. They will offer better heat dissipation which in turn helps keep the voice coil cool allowing their listener to crank it up for those long and loud listening sessions. JBL is using a butyl rubber surround and the cone material is what JBL refers to as polyplast. This is a proprietary cone designed to JBL and has been around for years. From what I have read, the cone material is made from two thin layers of plastic that is sandwiched on either side by two thicker layers of paper. As for the motor structure, JBL is using a pretty decent sized ferrite magnet for a six and a half inch driver that measures almost four inches in width. It'll be interesting to see what BL is when I measure the driver's TS parameters. JBL has opted not to use a vented pole piece in this design and instead punched holes in the cone underneath the dust cap. These holes will vent the trapped air behind the dust cap during long strokes. Now let's see how much this driver weighs. So the mid-range driver weighs three pounds and 14.3 ounces, pretty hefty. For comparison, the six and a half inch driver from my B&W 705S2 came in at three pounds and 13.5 ounces, and the driver from my SVS Ultra Evolution bookshelf came in at three pounds and 10.2 ounces. The results of the TS parameters from the JBL Studio 630 drivers were very interesting and a bit unexpected. Let me start with the good stuff first. The mid-range driver had a pretty clean impedance sweep that showed very little driver resonances taking place. There are some very small resonances taking place between 100 and 200 hertz, another around 600 hertz, and one more at 1.2 kilohertz. I think all of these resonances are small enough that they wouldn't be audible. Then there was another resonance around 4.6 kilohertz, but this driver won't be playing that high anyway, so it doesn't really matter. FS came in at 42 hertz or 47 hertz, depending on what driver I was looking at. I'll talk more about this later. The mid-range driver is pretty well damped and voice coil inductance is reasonably low at 0.21 millihenries. BL is above average for this price range and came in at around 6 tesla meters. Overall, a pretty decent driver for this price range. Now for the bad. Normally I don't show the measurements of both drivers because the differences between them are very small. But that wasn't the case with the Studio 630. As I was measuring both drivers on the Studio 630, the tolerances between them were quite substantial. For instance, FS between Woofer 1 and Woofer 2 have a difference of almost 
and total Q has a difference of almost 13%. Probably the most disturbing difference between these two drivers is in their impedance curve. Max impedance at resonant frequency came in at 56 ohms on Wolfer 2, and on Wolfer 1, it came in at 37 ohms. Yikes! I think a lot of these differences in parameters, especially in FS, can be attributed to the fact that JBL has some very loose manufacturing tolerances for these drivers. So what is causing these differences? I'm speculating here, but I think a lot of it has to do with CMS and MMS. CMS is a measure of suspension compliance in a driver. A driver with a stiff cone suspension will have a low CMS, and a driver with a loose cone suspension will have a higher CMS. If you look at the CMS parameter of each driver, then you will see they have a difference of over 20%. For MMS, it deals with total moving mass, including the total weight of the cone assembly and radiation mass. Maybe some assembly workers are applying more glue on the cone versus others, which is causing the large differences in variables. Again, I'm speculating here, but I'm a bit disappointed that JBL has set the tolerances so loose for these drivers, because other speakers in this price range have much tighter tolerances. For example, look at the impedance curve that I performed on my KEF-Q350 mid-range drivers. The impedance curve on both drivers is almost identical. This shows that KEF has some very tight tolerances between their drivers, which is very nice to see. I guess it's possible that I received a bad batch of drivers in my Studio 630s, but I doubt it because this should have been caught in QC. Now let's take a look at the tweeter. I tried removing the tweeter assembly with the waveguide and was having the same luck that I did when I attempted this with my Studio 530s. Simply put, I was unsuccessful. The tweeter in the Studio 630 is actually the same one from the previous model, the Studio 530. The tweeter is model number 2414H-1 and is a compression driver with a waveguide. At the sale price that I paid, the tweeter is very good for what you get. Here are the TS parameters of the tweeter that I measured. The tweeter has a resonant frequency of around 2.6 kHz. Either I got lucky with the tweeters in my Studio 630s, or JBL has tighter tolerances for their compression drivers. As you can see in the impedance suite, both tweeters measured very close to each other, unlike the mid-range drivers. The high resonant frequency surprised me because JBL is crossing over the tweeter at 1900 Hz, which is quite a bit lower than the resonant frequency of this driver. But I also have very limited experience with compression drivers, so I don't know if this is normal or not. The terminal cup is made from plastic and is held in by four 3mm Allen screws. So this is the terminal cup that I pulled out of the Studio 630s. I already removed one of the binding posts because, um, you know, I've tested these for ferromagnetic parts and they do have them in the signal path. So thankfully, it, the binding posts themselves are not made from steel. So as you can see, nothing there, but this tab made from steel and also this nut is made from steel. So I'm going to go ahead and replace both the uh, nut and the tab right here. I'm actually going to put a ring terminal on the end of mine and then use these brass nuts that I got off of Amazon, which I'll leave a link in the description to, um, to fasten the binding posts. Uh, to the terminal cup. You'll also want to use some silicone around here because you want to make sure this is good and sealed up. So, unfortunately there are some uh, ferromagnetic parts there, but it can be easily rectified. Remember that missing screw that I found? Well, it's from the crossover board. I guess someone at the factory forgot to tighten it down during assembly. For $700 per pair, JBL sure did dedicate a lot of parts to this crossover design. The tweeter circuit has three generic polyester film capacitors, an air core inductor, and a 10 watt 43 ohm sandcast resistor. The woofer circuit consists of three iron core inductors, two electrolytic caps, and two sandcast resistors. JBL is then using copper clad aluminum wire to connect all the drivers to the crossover board. In the name of science, I spent over $200 in crossover parts on my Studio 630s to see if using high quality parts will make a dramatic difference in sound quality. I'll be starting my JBL Studio 630 upgrade video series over the summer, so make sure to hit that notification bell if you'd like to hear what I found. 
For this build, I'll be using clarity caps on the tweeter circuit and good quality MKP caps on the woofer circuit. And everything that was using iron core inductors will be switched out for air core inductors. Here's a couple of teaser photos of the prototype crossover that I have been testing. JBL has improved the cabinet finish and construction significantly on the new 6 series over the outgoing 5 series. Even though these speakers are finished in a fake wood vinyl wrap, the quality of the wrap is good enough where I think it will fool most people into thinking it's real wood veneer. In my opinion, the cabinet has a higher end look to it that is very similar to JBL's higher end HDI series. JBL did a nice job with the finish on the cabinet, and in my opinion, it's much nicer than the finish on my Kev Q350s. I know this is a very subjective topic, but as for looks, I really like the appearance of the new Studio 6 series. I especially like how JBL rounded the corners of the cabinet and stamped Studio 6 on the top of the speaker. I think these small design details go a long way in improving the looks of the speaker. As for construction quality, JBL did a pretty nice job there too considering how affordable these speakers are. Since the cabinet is rounded on either side, the front baffle is 1 inch thick in the center and 3 quarters of an inch thick on the sides. The rear cabinet wall is 3 quarters of an inch thick and I would assume the side walls are too. There are no internal braces inside the cabinet, but JBL did line the inside of the cabinet with damping material. JBL has installed metal inserts on the front baffle to give the woofer a secure mounting point. I like these small details because as someone who likes to tinker with their speakers, these metal inserts will prevent the threads from stripping out. During my impedance sweep, there were some small cabinet resonances taking place at 364 Hz and another at 677 Hz. Any resonances beyond this frequency are caused by the driver. Overall, a pretty quiet cabinet. The port on the Studio 630 measures 6.5 inches in length and is 2 inches wide. The port is flared on both ends and I didn't hear any audible port chuffing during my listening sessions. JBL claims these speakers can get down to 45 Hz, and I would agree with that. Port tuning came in at around 43 Hz for both speakers. And that's my look inside video on the JBL Studio 630. If you have a pair of Studio 530s, then it's of my opinion that upgrading will be more of a lateral move in terms of sound quality. Yes, you will get more bass output with the 630s, but sonically, they sound very similar in my opinion. However, the nicer cabinet finish on the 630s might be worth the upgrade to some buyers. Overall, I'm pretty happy with my Studio 630s in terms of sound and build quality. At the $350 price that I paid, I doubt I'll find a better garage speaker for the money. My only gripe with these speakers is with the mid-range drivers because I wish JBL had tighter manufacturing tolerances on them. But since I'll be using these speakers in my garage, it isn't as important. I plan on doing an upgrade video series on the Studio 630s later this year where I upgrade the crossovers and add better damping material to see what kind of results I get. So make sure to hit that notification bell if you'd like to see that series. So long and happy listening.